Okay. okay, great. So my topic is about developments during sleep. And um, I chose the title Ontogenetic Sleep Matters, New Insights into the Sleep Brain Gut Connection. And I want to start with thanking the people who contributed to the work I'm presenting today, the ones I am particularly uh, grateful for, um, for being part of this work there underlined. And I also acknowledge our funders that make all of this work possible. Um, the outline of um, today's presentation um, I structured into a kind of an introduction on sleep and neurodevelopment to give you some insights into our um, older work to get the fundament for uh, the newer parts of the research I'd like to share today. Then I would like to go into uh, the topic beyond the brain, so sleep beyond the brain, which then connects to the gut microbiome. And particularly, I would like to present a study that we published last year um, that um, has been targeting the sleep brain gut axis in infants. Then I would like to show you some ongoing work from our lab that incorporates um, eating patterns into um, this framework. And then um, I would like to go into the model uh, that we call sleep umbrella model that was just published um, 10 days ago in PLOS One and present you this study. So the fascinating thing about sleep is that it is a brain state that is so unique that it's not present in any other behavioral state we experience. I assume uh, most of you have some background in um, sleep EEG or sleep neuroscience, so I just briefly would like to point out that particularly in the state of non-REM sleep, uh, the, the brain physiology, the neurophysiology undergoes a pattern that is very unique. Um, so we have these typical large uh, amplitude slow waves um, that are interesting because they go, uh, they undergo a large uh, maturational dynamic across the lifespan. You can see here in this graph that the amplitude of these waves um, undergoes a massive growth in the first decade of life and uh, a decrease thereafter, whereas during the rest of the lifespan, there's not much change going on. So that sleep plays a, an active role um, in, in neuronal maturational processes, that is not a new concept. Um, it has already been proposed in the 1960s that this sleep pattern, particularly the, the slow waves, the, the hallmark of deep sleep, that those um, could be a player to form the maturation of the brain, so to really be actively involved in that. Um, there are actually two hypotheses um, out now that, that we are working with, that others are working with, and that are gaining um, increasing interest. One, I'm sure you've heard of the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis by Tononi and Cirelli that promotes that during waking, there's a synaptic buildup um, of uh, new connections being formed basically, and a counterbalance to that is a downscaling of those neuronal formed connection during sleep. So wake and sleep uh, reflect processes that um, together account for um, a system that allows us to, to learn, to basically have the restored energy in the morning after a night of sleep to really form new learning connections again and to build new, um, to be able to process new input. The second hypothesis that is um, relevant for the context of development is related to myelin. So myelin is this fatty layer that is wrapped around the axons and that uh, facilitates uh, a fast speed of action potential transfer. And um, the, the underlying concept, concept of this hypothesis um, is supported by a growing evidence from animal studies that shows that during excessive sleep deprivation, this myelin sheet shrinks. And the idea is that it's, it would be possible that it detaches from the node of Ranvier and that the outer layer of myelin basically retracts back into the inner sheets. So this um, hypothesis basically uh, proposes that sleep is also important to enable the balance of myelin. So during development, the brain is undergoing a lot of different dynamics. Um, some of them are happening in, in the gray matter, 
part of the cortex and this is a picture to choose to, to visualize um, that the density and the number of synaptic contacts just across the first few years, uh, four years in this example of life undergoes a, just a growth in, in this network density. And um, this maturational part is also happening on a spatial dimension. So across the cortex, this, this growth is not uh, happening everywhere at the same time. Um, and MRI studies are showing that um, the, the thickness, so uh, kind of an estimate of this network synaptic density, um, that this thickness is being maximal, so that this maturational time point is reached early um, in the back of the region of the brain, so in the more posterior regions of the brain, so these are the colored um, areas, and that um, the, it experiences a back-to-front maturation, so basically with the frontal regions um, maturing last. So a study we conducted about uh, over a decade ago um, was with children between 2 and 20 years of age. We were interested how their topographical, how their sleep map looks like, because in adults, it was known at the time point that um, when we adults sleep, we have most of slow wave, so most of this deep sleep feature over frontal regions of the brain, so like you would see here on the right side in red, uh, but it was unknown how that would behave across maturation. That's why we launched this study with somewhat over 50 healthy children, and we plotted their um, distribution of, of slow wave activity. And uh, the most um, interesting finding here is that in contrast to adults with this frontal maximum, so this frontal um, response to, um, to our daily needs, I would say, if we interpret that with the homeostasis hypothesis, is that in kids, this deep sleep is maximal over posterior regions. So also here, you can see that with increasing age, there's a shift forward um, in the location of where deep sleep is most prominent. We um, were then interested whether there's any functional relevance um, to this um, major shift in deep sleep across uh, development. And we defined regions of interest based on Brotman areas. So for example, we uh, defined regions where language uh, is believed to be kind of uh, dominant, or I would say like a, a prominent feature for that, for that uh, brain region. We had some motor areas defined and so on. And we performed a number of tests um, with a cohort of 60 children um, that would then give us information on the variance in these areas. And we had the idea that the more advanced an individual topography, so an individual sleep map in this pattern, in this low wave pattern we saw above, the more advanced would also uh, the behavior be. And indeed, this was the case, such that um, this hypothesis was confirmed. We were then also interested how is like the timely relevance. So is it not the behavioral aspect that matures earlier, or is it more um, the, the, the neurophysiological aspect that matures earlier? And we could find a difference of a few years, such that the, the, the change in sleep happened a few years earlier than this um, improvement of skills across development. I have to say here, this is a cross-sectional study, so it's not longitudinal data, and that was uh, the first just to go in the direction to, to test this idea. So as in any study, this is very much simplified, so it's not only gray matter, of course, that is relevant for, for these behaviors and the cortical activity, but also white matter is one um, highly relevant morphological aspect across development. Um, the primary content of uh, white matter is myelin, and um, there are existing MRI sequences that can capture or estimate the um, 
um, the, the content of myelin, I would say. So this is a, a study that used the so-called MacDesperd MRI. And, and this uh, is a kind of a using a two-pool structure or model with microstructure to estimate um, how myelin um, growth is happening here in this example in infancy. And this method has also been used to track neurodevelopment and degeneration um, that would be histological histologically correlated to myelin content. So we were wondering, is this myelin content, so this growth of, of myelin across childhood, is this reflected in the sleep EEG, in, in brain connectivity? And uh, we conducted a study that was done while I was a postdoc um, in Colorado Boulder with uh, Monique Le Bourgeois. And we um, assessed uh, a number of children um, with a scanner. We actually assessed them while they were sleeping. That's why we modified the scanner with uh, sound insulating um, foam inside here. So that's a really heavy material that will just uh, dampen the noise that is produced during a scanning sequence. And we would um, block out the light because we would ourselves also be in the dark while um, scanning these children. So I'm not going into detail with this study, but what we found is overall that the, topogra the topographical distribution of slow activity, so this sleep map, um, would again um, be related to brain anatomy. So in this case, to myelin growth, and it would be predictive of that. So again, the pattern of sleep, so the sleep EG pattern would precede the maturation of brain anatomy. So in this case, this was a distance um, of three and a half years uh, where we um, assessed these children. And you can see here, like the main relationship was found with the overall, uh, the whole brain content of myelin and not so much with, with more um, isolated measures. Uh, some relationship was also found with the superior longitudinal fascicle, but the most strongest relationship was found with the whole brain um, myelin content. So overall, several features of the sleep EEG that are considered traits in adults, um, they do experience substantial dynamics across development. So the fundament of sleep homeostasis is the buildup of sleep pressure across the day. And then I, I assume the audience is familiar with the two process model. Um, of sleep regulation, which has um, the underlying uh, assumption that the sleep pressure builds up as we are awake and, um, and decreases while we are asleep. So this buildup of sleep pressure is well studied in, in adults. And we performed a study that was also done in Boulder um, to test how is this working in children. So this is a longitudinal data set where children are studied when they're two years old, three years old, and then again, five years old. And it was a well-controlled study design that would include a morning nap, an afternoon nap, and an evening nap. So basically the idea was to, to be able to model this increase um, across the day and then across development. And what you can see here is that um, from three to five years, in particular, there's a major decrease in how much slow wave, so how much deep sleep was then captured within this nap. So this gives us an idea that also the dynamics of the, the homeostatic buildup of the sleep pressure, they are um, undergoing a period of maturation. In adults, when we are sleep deprived, um, there's a, a reaction um, primarily of the frontal cortex that then would, as a response, would show increased deep sleep. So again, increased slow effectivity. And you see this here in yellow. We performed a study with uh, sleep restriction in children. That was um, quite challenging for them and fun for us <laughs> or also challenging for us sometimes, of course, uh, but it's uh, a sleep restriction protocol where the children would only get 50% of their habitual sleep. So if they would normally sleep 10 hours, they would only be um, sleeping five hours in this example. And you see here with the, with the dots, with the marks, 
that their response to sleep restriction was not the same as in adults. So it did not happen frontally, but it happened over these posterior regions. So again, showing some aspect that something that is considered a trait in adults does undergo uh, dynamics across childhood. And then another measure we looked at are, um, was the pattern of the how slow waves occur and especially where they go. So this um, famous study from Marcello Massimini and colleagues shows or illustrates that if a wave starts here and you have the possibility to record a brain activity across the whole cortex, you can see a delay. So there's basically an origin of these waves and then, and then it spreads across the scalp uh, with some regions where it derives last. And we studied that also in children. So these so-called traveling waves, we studied them in children and we found that the older um, those kids get, the further those waves would travel. So there's further, there's longer distances with older age um, in this time period of two to 12 years. We also found some relationship with myelin content. Um, so here, like the more myelin, so the more white matter, um, uh, yeah, the, the more of this white matter component uh, was there, the further these waves uh, would travel. So again, here, sleep is giving us an insight into what is happening in the brain um, during maturation. So this is the first conclusion of, um, of this talk. Um, during development, there are several behavioral functions maturing, starting with the uh, somatosensory maturation to learn the vision here and touch and so on. And the latest ones to mature are the higher cognitive functions. And this sequence of maturation is reflected in several dimensions of the sleep EG. So the sleep EG gives us a mirror to look into um, what is happening on the behavioral level. And so what we are working with is that um, uh, the concept that the, the learning um, during the day um, is in balance with the pattern of sleep so, and the recovery that sleep gives um, in the night. And that is particularly relevant because it is known that when there's a chronic period of poor sleep in children or particularly tested with animals as well, that there are later consequences in behavior. So this altogether um, supports the view that sleep does fulfill some active contributing role um, for the brain to mature. I have mentioned the two process model of sleep regulation, um, which builds on the process S and C, but I think it is interesting to think about uh, that there might, sorry, that there might be actually more than two processes. So I think we could expand this model into a multi-process model. And um, I think um, the elements to add there is the, the gut, the digestive system, and particularly the microbiome that is located in our digestive tract. And just to exemplify, I'm showing you here a study that was published two or three years ago uh, with mice that underwent um, excessive sleep deprivation. So you can see 10 days of sleep deprivation. And the authors, they um, visualized where the effects in the different organs would be most severe. So you see here brain, muscle, da da da, but also the gut. And those um, those conditions here that had experienced this um, extensive sleep deprivation would see an accumulation of reactive oxygen species, so that those are um, kind of cellular uh, side products so to simplify. Uh, but basically what this work shows is that when there's severe sleep deprivation, there's oxidative stress and they, it affects particularly the gut in this example. So the gut is central in this process of harmful effects of severe sleep deprivation. 
I've mentioned the microbiome. I don't have time to go into too much details, but what we know today is that the microbes represent a interface between our body um, and they are part of our biology. So they help us to adapt um, to environmental needs, to food. They can influence our physiological processes and they can also adapt our behavioral and physiological responses. This work is ongoing. So there's um, many groups that are um, working on the gut brain axis and some of the pathways on how this connection should take place um, has been summarized in work of um, endocrine pathways. So the blood um, pathway that would um, facilitate the, the dialogue between the brain and the gut, but also the immune system and also the nerve. So particularly the vagus nerve. Um, has also been identified as communicating pathway between the gut and the brain. One seminal experiment I would like to mention that has been done uh, a while ago um, that was with mice and it shows that early colonization of the bacteria are crucial for brain functioning. So in this example, uh, there were two groups of mice and some were raised in germ-free conditions. So they were not um, in, in contact with any bacteria. And in a test response, those without the bacteria would show a much exaggerated response. Also, the mice that did not have any microbiota in their digestive system, um, they showed reduced plasticity. Um, so the, the marker of plasticity, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, was much reduced in the cortex, but also in the hippocampus. Um, that colonization early in life is crucial for the brain has also or is increasingly investigated in human studies. Um, a large studies with babies, uh, nearly 90 babies identified that there are about three different clusters um, of patterns of, of these uh, bacterial profiles in the digestive tract. And particularly, um, they tested that the, the way these patterns um, were present at the age of one year, um, they would predict um, at two years the behavior of, of these babies. So basically with the testing uh, with different subgroups of motor skills, visual reception and so on, particularly the language skills of these babies would be related to the um, uh, the, the bacteria, the bacterial pattern they had a year earlier. So showing that um, there's a relevance between the gut and the brain. But we, of course, are interested in sleep, and I'm, I'm not going into details here, but research is growing that there is indeed a sleep-gut connection um, in, uh, in mice or on rodents. It has been shown in adults. It's increasingly shown, but nothing has been known in babies. And because on the one hand, there's so much happening in the sleep regulation in, in the early years of life, and so much happening in the buildup of the microbiome. So usually it takes up to three years for, for uh, adult-like microbiome to develop. Um, it would, would be very interesting to see um, what that connection is. So we conducted a study, and this is uh, my former PhD student, Sarah Schoch, who is now a postdoc at the Donders Institute in the Netherlands. And we conducted a longitudinal study and that uh, took into account sleep behavior, stool samples, behavior, um, but also EEG. So here you see the age. First assessments were done with nearly 150 participants at three months, then at six months of age, then at 12 months, and some follow-up at 24 months of age. And this was a kind of well-controlled sample. So these are healthy children um, yeah, with a particular inclusion exclusion criteria. And we found that their profiles of the microbiome um, were as expected. So a lot of bifidobacterium, a lot of bacteroides, and with increasing age, those uh, profiles would get more diverse. 
Um, for the microbiome, we used, uh, well, we worked with collaborators in Denmark and at ETH in Zurich uh, to help us with this uh, rather complex um, sequencing, sequencing and biostatistics. So we used the 16S RNA sequencing that targets a gene in bacteria um, that is uh, phylogenetically conserved. So it will help to identify which bacteria are present in a stool sample. And with that, we use three measures. One is just a measure of diversity, so the most commonly used measure of alpha diversity. Um, then we also used enterotypes. I will come to that in a second, and the maturation index. For behavior, we use the parent-rated questionnaire. Um, so the parents would fill out how well their infants uh, performed in overall developmental questions. And we were particularly uh, interested in motor and personal social development. We had with a subset of um, infants, we had a, a sleep assessment at night. And we also used a movement center at the ankle of the babies uh, to compute uh, the so-called sleep composites. What are these sleep composites? So if we are looking at um, actimetry across a day, so here's the timeline. It's like each line represents a 24 hour day. The blue represents immobility and the yellow represents mobility. What you can see here by eye is already that it's getting more and more consolidated. So less fragmented with increasing age. Um, but how to quantify that? It's not so easy. <clears throat> we had an intern, Cecil Müller, who um, made this animation for us. So the question is, how can you take from these nearly 50 sleep variables that are possible to derive from actimetry, how do you take the most relevant ones? And then basically this was a data-driven approach, again by Sarah Schoch, who was able to group these variables into larger uh, topics, um, and we call them sleep composites, um, to really be able to have a data-driven way and not a, like a purely selective way of which variable to work with um, for the uh, future analysis. And our results show that sleep and the gut microbiome were indeed related in the sample. So here you see um, the expression of daytime sleep, basically. So the more and the longer and they would nap, the lower the diversity um, in, the, in the gut microbiome would be. So this is expected because less napping means being more mature and higher alpha diversity also means being more mature. And this relationship was strongest at the age of three months. So that seems to be a particularly sensitive period um, for the, the linkage between um, sleep and the gut microbiome maturation. I've mentioned enterotypes. So maybe you can imagine the microbiome. That's a very complex topic. There's not only alpha diversity. I mean, indeed, it's a, a composition of a number of species. That's a whole ecosystem. And there are approaches to simplify that. Um, and here, uh, this is a publication that showed kind of like the dynamic of how these patterns evolved and how they compare to each other would reveal three particular enterotypes. So three types of um, stool providers <laughs> that would be uh, more similar within each other. And in our sample, we found two enterotypes and let's just call them A and B. And we, um, we measured their sleep with the EEG and found that enterotype A um, had less deep sleep than enterotype B. So in all these white dots, and that's um, a, a large fraction of the electrodes, um, enterotype B would have more deep sleep than enterotype A. So with that, we could see that indeed in infants, the neurophysiology of sleep, so the brain markers um, of sleep, would be related to the profiles of the microbiome. Um, in those infants. I will skip that. And then we also um, examined how enterotypes would evolve. So there's um, distribution of enterotypes was such that at three months, 
uh, more babies were entered type A and um, only a few entered type B, which was very similar at six months, but then at 12 months, that switched. So it's not something that is a stable trait. It's something that is really dynamic, which makes it complex and irritating, but also very um, exciting to further study. Um, so basically you have four possibilities with this pattern. You can be entered type A and stay A. You can be entered type B and stay B. You can be A and switch to B or you can be B and switch to A. And these developmental trajectories are, are really interesting also because they're known to, um, to be related to like uh, uh, behavioral trends or like um, maturational transitions. So these four patterns would also show a relationship with LEAP. Uh, just to simplify that uh, the type of babies that had more bifida bacteria uh, compared to those who switched, they would have more awakenings at night, for example. And then we wondered, well, it is known that this gut brain link is going into two directions. It's going top down, but also bottom up. So the brain has some um, influence on the gut bacteria, but the gut bacteria can also influence the brain. So we wondered within our data set, um, is, it, is there such a top down dynamic that the brain measures would uh, be related to um, measures of the microbiome? And we did find the relationship um, for the EG power in the, in the theta frequency um, that is also uh, relevant for, for a number of brain markers. And we found that the, um, the more theta activity there was, the lower was the alpha diversity. So indeed, there is some aspect of a top-down dynamic. So that at, <clears throat> <excuse me. clears throat> at six months, uh, the brain measures would be predictive of the later bacterial profiles. So we were interested in how is that related to behavior and that's just a fraction um, of the results. And just to summarize, we did find that um, like how advanced the behavior was. So would it be like uh, the collective score of the behavior, particularly also motor or, or the personal social development of the baby, um, that that would be related to the bedtimes. And we found strongest relationship, uh, again, with daytime sleep. So the more pronounced the daytime sleep, um, the less advanced the behavior. And additionally, we also found um, some predictive relationship between um, bedtimes and uh, behavioral outcomes later. So basically, sleep-wake behavior at six months would also be predictive on how um, advanced or how mature a child's behavior was. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, this sounds quite complex, but we're basically exploring the relationships between sleep behavior, sleep in the brain, and the, the microbiome profiles in the gut. And then we wonder at this point also, is it sleep or is it, is it uh, the gut microbiome that is more related to an infant's behavior? And we did find a little bit of a specification. So for the sleep-wake behaviors, we found a closer relationship um, to personal social development. While for the microbial profiles, we found a closer relation to, to the motor development. So our conclusion for the second part is yes, there is also a sleep brain gut connection in infancy that is not as simple because it's changing across ages. Again, like, like almost any measure uh, that we're looking at. So it is dynamic across ages, meaning that it can give us information on about vulnerable transitions of maturation. And we do find most relationships with daytime sleep. So daytime sleep seems to be an indicator of how mature um, somebody's brain is um, to also then be connected to other physiological measures of behavior, uh, like behavioral functioning, but also of the microbiome profile in the gut. So the microbiome is influenced by a number of factors. Um, food, of course, uh, medication, but also the timing of when food is taken in. Um, 
So basically, I'm sure like as part of this year, as you know, like how light can influence our, our brains, but um, in a very similar way, also the timing of eating and actually the, the content of eating can influence the clocks that are not so much in our brain, but rather in our periphery. So that this together, the light and the food rhythm could lead to output of uh, rhythmic output of sleep-wake behavior, of hormones, but also of uh, particular organs like the liver, for example. So for example, um, the time-specific eating uh, can benefit sleep. One study in flies, for example, showed that um, time-restricted feeding, um, so that's also kind of a fancy diet at the moment, I would say, or like a eating behavior that a lot of people are exploring with um, at the moment. So that would mean to kind of not have a large window of when eating is allowed, but to shorten that, to have periods of um, not eating and periods of eating more. So that was done in flies too. And uh, overall, it shows uh, that while their intake of food, so the intake of calorie uh, was not changed, um, and the, the, the um, activity behavior was also not changed, but it would um, increase their sleep duration. So that was interesting. And the authors that proposed that the circadian clock would be a mediating pathway for that. A study very similar was also done in humans, there are actually two I'm presenting here, uh, where also the eating window would, would be restricted. So like in an uh, example with obese um, participants, uh, this window was shortened by three to four hours, so to only have 10 or 11 hours for a duration of a couple of months. Um, and also here, this would lead to improved sleep that in this case was uh, reported subjectively. Similarly, also in an example with uh, patients with metabolic syndrome that would also improve sleep quality. So we know that sleep and eating rhythms together regulate <clears throat> the plasma profile, excuse me, <clears throat> that regulate uh, basically the how um, the, the metabolic profile is, is measured in the blood. So if we have a circadian alignment of sleep to our um, daytime needs, so here, for example, sleep from midnight um, to eight in the morning, we have a certain expression of our biological um, plasma composition. Um, in contrast to when we have a misaligned sleep period, so we start to sleep at nine in the morning and sleep until five in the afternoon, um, this expression of the plasma would also be changed. So in infants, this is exactly what we look at because infants, they have to learn um, that they have to learn how to uh, organize their rhythm into our 24 hour society. So these infants experience some kind of a, of a shift work or some kind of a jet lag. And then the role during these um, early months um, is to really find alignment with what we expect from them basically to be. So we wondered um, how is the infant's rhythm uh, of eating related to their sleep? And this is a study that's just in, in preparation now or has been submitted by my PhD, PhD student, Christophe Millimater. Um, and he um, created uh, an index um, to quantify eating regularity. And on the left, you see this index in an example where uh, infant would have a very regular food intake. And on the right, you see an example of very irregular food intake. So what you see here is that the large bars, they basically say that it is very likely that this child would have a meal between 7 and 8 p.m. Um, this eating regularity index would then increase across um, maturation as expected. And interesting for us was to see that the more regular the eating, um, the less activity at night was observed. So the less those kids would move during the night and would wake up during the night. 
And then we wondered, well, is it the gut bacteria that is driving this relationship between how regular uh, the babies eat and how much they move at night? And we did not find the overall relationship, which is how mature um, their profile was, but we found a relationship uh, with particular bacteria, so for mucutis in this case, so that the more regular the babies would eat, the more abundant this bacteria would be. <clears throat> Uh, we then also wondered whether, um, like how much parents can contribute to this relationship. So we had them fill out the survey um, and then basically ask how well um, <clears throat> they would um, take care of or how high they would rate that their babies would have a structure. And um, this idea of structure so that the parents wish for a, a structure of regular bedtimes and regular daytime sleep was linked to effectively their, their bedtimes. It was also linked to how regularly they eat, of course, but it was not linked to, to nighttime movement or the fragmentation um, of their sleep at night. So it's not a direct relationship between the eating and the sleep. So it is, again, a little bit more complicated. Um, we believe a few more points have to be taken into account, um, such that the timing of feeding um, actually relates to, to melatonin synthetization. This was done in fish, and I think it's an interesting part to follow up on. And also that uh, melatonin then can affect the bacterial gene expression. So again, it seems to be bilateral. Um, and then there's also, it's not just like the digestive tract um, that via the bloodstream would connect um, to the brain. But again, as I said, there's also the vagus nerve that has to be incorporated. Um, it is interesting for the future to also incorporate that um, bacteria are undergoing rhythmic activity across the day. Not all of them, but a large fraction of them does have some kind of circadian or diurnal rhythm. And we are currently exploring that uh, with our cross-sectional core to see uh, is there some change, like depending on when a stool sample is taken, um, that the composition according to the daytime is also changing. So the conclusion for this part is that the more regular uh, the infants eat, that the less they move at night. So we did find the correlation there that was true for six and 12 months of age. Um, and we did find a link to the microbiome, uh, particularly due to the, the bacteria Firmicutes, uh, while the overall markers were not linked. Um, we did find that parenting, so the idea of structured parenting, that this is linked to infant bedtimes, but it does not directly affect the nighttime movement, but there could be some um, interaction with eating regularity. And so to, to summarize this, and I'm not quite done yet, I think, but you have to interrupt me if this is going too far. Maybe I'll take like four more minutes or so. Um, but to, just to summarize, um, so the baby is in a situation where it has to learn the adaptation to, to this two process model. So on the one side, the homeostatic rhythm that is linked to learning and to, to brain maturation. Um, but on the other hand, also the circadian aspect where of course light plays an important role. And we do know from a research from Monique Libourgeois group, and I think there was somebody in the talk, um, Lauren Hartstein, I believe, who was giving a presentation on that as well. They do experimental um, protocols with children that show that children are more sensitive to light. And I think this is also an important thing to consider um, in this whole concept, uh, concept of rhythm learning. Uh, we are um, starting to understand that bacteria and eating are relevant in the emergence of rhythm and that also the family context plays a role. And maybe just a brief wrap up um, on the new paper um, that we have been doing a study, and that's my PhD student, Mathieu Bocon, who just published this, published this paper in PLOS One, um, where we studied does the, the sleep that has been worsened as part of the pandemic, um, how does that relate to later function? And um, just briefly, there are some relationships, particularly the kids who uh, suffered from more nighttime awakenings because of the pandemic, um, that those 
do show lower scores in cognitive function, per, so particularly in inhibitory um, skills and emotional control six months later. So this supports the concept that sleep does fulfill a protective role. So kind of like an umbrella during childhood, uh, particularly during this period that is so vulnerable to influences of stress um, and to other influences that could interfere with development um, that this can be seen as protective umbrella. And uh, I think this is the really the last slide um, that is a paper that was uh, published uh, even the year before, where he identified factors that would be protective or that would be harmful in the context of, of a pandemic in this case, um, to really give also families an idea on where um, there are things to be identified that can be done to, to improve or to protect children's sleep, which then also could have wider consequences for their behavior, for their emotion regulation, and so on. So with this, I would end. You see there's a few